You are listening to the Wool Academy podcast. This is episode number 42. Hello and welcome. My name is Elizabeth Van Delden and once a week we talk to an industry expert from the wool industry supply chain from farm to fashion and beyond, delivering strategies and insights to be successful in wool and showcasing those beautiful stories wool has to tell. Today's Wool Academy guest is Don McDonald. Don runs his own wool broker business based out of Dubbo in New South Wales, Australia. Interestingly, Don grew up on a dairy farm. But he says once he got a taste for wool through a wool classing course, he never set a foot on a dairy farm ever since. Don will tell us more about his lifelong career in wool in just a moment. But first, I'm happy to welcome Don on the show. How are you, Don? It's so good to be talking to you. I'm very good, Elizabeth, and good to be talking with you. Great. I really appreciate your time. You were just telling me that you just finished a sale. So let's get right started to not waste any more of your time today. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and the work that you do. Well, I've had a lifetime in the wool industry. I commenced my time in the wool industry in 1975. I studied uh, wool classing uh, in Sydney and following graduation uh, as a wool classer, I travelled to the outback of New South Wales and worked in the shearing sheds for about eight years, um, both wool classing and shearing. During that time, I saw what career paths there may be available and uh, through a fairly large wool grower at the time, I was able to secure a job with wool stores in Sydney. And I spent four years working for a company in Sydney and in Newcastle, learning the trade really. Wool classing is only the beginning of uh, your, your journey with the wool pipeline, as everyone knows, there's lots of different aspects to it, but um, I quickly found a niche uh, being connected with the raw material end, and um, I got a job with this wool broker, graduated to be an auctioneer and wool valuer, and a client advisor, and so uh, with that experience behind me, I decided in 1988 to open a business, uh, Lenoc Wool, and uh, based in Dubbo, and um, uh, basically I'm still in Dubbo, and um, the business is now called McDonald and Company Wool Brokers, uh, and we are um, one of the, the larger regional wool brokers in Australia. Yeah, and tell me a little bit more about your company, McDonald and Co. Wool Brokers. What kind of services do you offer? Our principal role is to act as agent for the wool grower. So we travel out to the properties at shearing time and we liaise with both the grower and the wool classer and the shearing contractors in the preparation of the wool clip. So one of our key roles is to be a conduit of information between the processor, the wool exporter, and the grower. And so the messages that we um, gather from talking to downstream uh, processes, we take back to the growers and make sure that when they're preparing their clips, everything's been done to obtain best market advantage. When the wool clip is um, finished and bailed up, it's transported in here. So we provide a service for farm pickups. We have our own truck or they use their own carriers. And we have a 7,500 square metre warehouse in Dubbo with uh, core tests and sampling machinery and forklifts. And of course, the administration area that's attached to that. So we do the logistics side of preparing the wool for sale, gathering the samples, sending them off to the AWTA. And we hold sales in uh, Sydney at Yonora. Uh, there's 46 of those auction sales a year. And so we have a technical team that not only works with the growers, but also works with the buyers. And we, we attend those sales, sell the wool for the grower. And then 
and then do the accounting side of things. We invoice the buyers, we invoice the grower, we collect the money, we pay the grower. And so the cycle goes on. It's As I said, it's nearly weekly. Um, we have side services like the ram selection, sheep classing, um, merchandise sales for sheep-related uh, products. But our core function is to sell the wool on behalf of the uh, grower and advise him the best way to market it. Sometimes that might be through forward sales, uh, he hedging the clip against the, the indicator. Uh, it might be using electronic sales, which is only a small proportion, but may grow in time. And of course, uh, the auction system. The company has a show floor uh, in Sydney at, at the wool sales and the samples from the wool uh, go down every week, shown in the, in the boxes where the buyers inspect them and there's a roster for the auction and we, we sell our wool. And, uh, the process, as I said, the process is repeated almost every week. Okay, thanks for explaining that in, in that detail. And you said earlier that you consider yourself like a regional wool broker. So, and how is that different to then, I guess, what maybe other brokers would be that would be nationwide set up? And do you offer any particular services that are different to the other brokers? Well, that's a good question. Um, a little bit of history with that is um, uh, the the wool, all wool was stored in, in uh, major centres up until recent years, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide, Fremantle. In the late 80s and during the 90s, regional wool brokers, independent wool brokers, I suppose you would say, family-owned businesses that, um, unlike the corporate companies that dominated the, the wool brokering scene, um, of course, there still are some corporate companies uh, in existence, but largely um, between 50 and 60 percent of the wool brokers in Australia today are companies like ourselves. And every major centre around the sheep growing areas might have one or two wool stores. Uh, Dubbo has grown to become a fairly major centre. In fact, it's the largest storage centre in. New South Wales now, and there are uh, four wool stores in Dubbo. And um, the other in Goulburn, of course, is one in New South Wales and Wagga, etc. So um, we still refer to ourselves as a regional uh, wool brokers because our base is in, the, is, is in the country, not in the cities. Our corporate headquarters or our head office headquarters are uh, out where the wool is grown, and that's sort of a, a bit of a difference to the mainstream traditional companies where their headquarters might be in capital cities like Adelaide or Melbourne. Um, our headquarters are where the farmers are. Yeah, and that brings me to my next question. Let's talk about double, <laughs> because, yeah, I... To be honest, I've never heard of Dubbo before I, I was sent there uh, to to participate at, at a wool event. And yeah, Dubbo is already considered in the outback. And yeah, for tourists, the outback is mainly associated with very dry land and also the Uluru. But can you tell us how would you, def or how is the outback defined properly? And also how should we imagine the outback? Well, Dubbo is sort of the gateway to the outback. Um, it, it sits at the edge of what they call the slopes and the plains. And um, as you progress west of Dubbo, the country gets drier and drier. And uh, you, get to, you get to a point where uh, farming, that is sowing crops and growing crops, can't be sustained as you get somewhere around uh, 300 kilometres west of Dubbo, you start to get to what is really called the outback. And the towns become very few and far between. There really are no, there's no cities. Dubbo is the last city going west. And for example, it's um, 350 kilometres to Burke, which is considered the outback. And then beyond Burke, 
there's really nothing. Alice Springs is in the centre of Australia, 17 or 1800 kilometres away. Beyond Burke, there are really only villages and they might only be um, a bridge across the river with a hotel, six or eight houses, an old post office. Uh, the general store probably closed 20 years ago and it's inhabited by 15 or 20 people. But those little villages, as you will remember going to Louth, become the centre of um, entertainment and social gathering for a, a very large area. Uh, most of those villages would draw on an area that might be 150 or 200 kilometres across. So that's uh, a bit of a picture of the outback. The, the rainfall is not regular. The annual rainfall in those areas is only around 250 millimetres per annum. And um, the seasons can vary an awful lot from year to year. Yeah, and let's talk a little bit more about then what a typical wool property would look like in the outback and how would it be different to properties who might be, you know, in a high rainfall area? The main differences will be the size of the property. Because the country is, firstly, the country is very natural. Um, unlike the higher rainfall areas where um, certainly in Australia, the country's been farmed for the last 150 to 200 years. There's a lot of fertiliser, um, ploughing the land, growing crops, then growing grass, running livestock and so forth. Once you move into the outback, the country is pretty well in its natural state as it was when white men went there in the 1840s, 1850s. And so the merino sheep adapted very well to the dry climate. They essentially like, they prefer dry weather to wet weather. That was one of the first things the early settlers found out about merino sheep. They, they thrive under the natural conditions. They make very good use of natural pastures. And so the, the, um, the, the landscape is uh, generally reasonably flat, sometimes undulating away from the rivers has quite a lot of trees and some thick scrub close to the rivers and there's a major river that flows through the outback in new south wales which is the darling river there's big wide flood plains with very rich soil that only flood periodically uh, and the natural grasses and shrubs that grow there are very good for the sheep the sheep run in an area of maybe one sheep per five hectares. Uh, and of course, um, they have to compete with lots of kangaroos, uh, emus, um, feral goats, um, sometimes wild dogs, and that's a problem. So, so most paddocks that the farmer would have on his property, and an average property might be anywhere between 15 to 20,000 hectares up to 200,000 hectares. Um, most of those places would, would run uh, anywhere from five to 20,000 sheep. And those paddocks that the sheep run in would, would be, each mob might have two, three, 4,000 hectares per, per paddock. So uh, a big area and can take a whole day just to muster one paddock on a property. Yeah, I can hardly imagine these sizes. Um, but yeah, thank you for describing them to us. Already one sheep per five hectares sounds huge. <laughs> and yeah, you already touched a little bit upon um, kind of the natural grasses and so on. Because typically you would think um, that you know, sheep eat grass, and but there it's not the typical grass and green pastures, obviously. It's really dry and, and these scrubs, as you call them. And yeah, how did the sheep adapt to that? And maybe describe what they eat a little bit in more detail. Well, one of the, the good things about the diet that sheep have in, in 
in the outback is a wide range of shrubs, bushes, uh, trees with low branches, uh, obviously grass at different times. Um, after rain, particularly summer rain, the grass grows. And all those plants, because of the low rainfall, are nutrient enriched. So it's a very um, it's a very good natural climate for the sheep to graze in as compared to uh, the higher rainfall areas towards the coast where sheep run. Um, it become, Their diet becomes a mono diet. There's grass and grass and that's all there is where um, out, out in the outback they'll, they'll get these saline bushes and um, shrubs and mulder and all different different things and what we've found over the years is that generally those sheep need less animal husbandry they need um, no need for drenches no need for vaccinations um, um, the, the drier climate is certainly better for parasite control so it's a it's a, it's a very good natural climate for sheep to be in and, and by and large because they walk further distances to water they grow bigger. They uh, they're bigger and stronger and way heavier. And, and there's a, in, in you know the merino industry today is a dual purpose industry because farmers don't just um, make their money out of the wool. They make their money out of selling sheep. And the outback sheep uh, are fairly highly sought after because because of um, the size of them and their ability to thrive under harsher conditions. Yes, indeed, I was quite amazed when I saw um, some merino sheep uh, two years ago during the Adaptive con Congress in Sydney. We saw some sheep and they were huge and I've never seen a sheep that huge. So um, it is quite amazing how large they can get by now. We already said a little bit about rainfall, but what can you also talk a little bit more about the typical challenges that wool growers would face uh, in the outback? Well, drought is always the largest challenge for any farmer, um, and, and that's regardless of whether you're a farmer in Germany or a farmer in Australia. If it doesn't rain, you've got problems. But the, the challenges of drought are larger in the outback because of the distances. Um, we, we have clients um, that are six to seven hours drive from Dubbo, for example. And as I said, Dubbo is the last major city. Um, so the, the distances uh, make a difference. And, and the distances on the property, if, if you want to hand feed sheep, for example, you've got the extra freight component to get the grain out there because there's no grain grown in the outback. And, and then once you get it there, you most places don't have infrastructure to handle that because they're not used to it. Um, so generally, drought is the biggest challenge. There are the challenges of um, competition, particularly from feral goats and kangaroos. Um, kangaroos uh, have sort of become not plague proportion, but um, because they're so mo mobile, anyone who has rain uh, in an area when there's drought tends to attract all the kangaroos and so his food gets gets eaten out fairly quickly. Um, wild dogs um, have become a problem which has manifested itself up in Queensland over the 20 years and wild dogs not only a problem in Queensland now but they're moving down into New South Wales and of course with sheep um, wild dogs can be a severe problem. Um, there's also the, the issue, because it's um, remote, the issue of workforce in the outback. Generally, uh, the, best, the best operators, the best farmers in the outback are the people who live there, who are born and bred there, who understand the climate, who have seen all this before, and particularly the bigger families who have family members who are happy to live out there. It's, 
it can be very challenging in the outback to attract people from the more settled areas. They, they think it's great to go and visit the outback, but then they really don't want to live out there because it's so far away. So they're, they're some of the, the typical challenges that you get, but I would rate drought at the top of the list. Okay, thank you um, for explaining that. And yeah, I remember um, you just mentioned earlier that yeah, we did go to Laos for a wool event as well. And you also said earlier that these little towns then um, get visited by a lot of people who live 200 or 300 kilometers away. And indeed, I also remember talking to a wool grower in, in the pub and he just said, oh yeah, I just live up the road around 300K. And I thought, that's not up the road. <laughs> that's really far away. But yeah, distance is, is really a totally different measure in the outback. And also for you, how do you manage to visit your wool growers? Because they're so sp far spread across the outback. Well... When I started business, as, as, as I said, I, I worked in the outback uh, for about eight years and I got to, to know a lot of farmers. And when I started my own business, my principal focus was visiting the people I knew uh, to offer my services to them. And, and a lot of our business uh, since then has been focused on these people in the outback because I, I know them so well and I relate to them. But as, as my business grew, I found that it was harder and harder to visit them on their properties by, by car, by motor vehicle, because um, I, I've certainly done days where I've driven a thousand kilometers in a day um, just to go and visit a couple of clients and then drive back because I have to go to a wool sale or something. So about 18 years ago, I decided to learn to fly and um, Small aeroplanes have been part of the outback since the late 50s. Uh, and um, we have a lot of clients who over the years have had aeroplanes or still have them, have airstrips on their properties. And a lot of those airstrips are right beside the shearing shed because uh, they use the aeroplanes to muster sheep. So I decided I'd learn to fly and I bought an aeroplane and Largely, when I travel in the outback, that's how I go. And instead of spending five hours to drive and visit a client, I can be out there in an hour and a half and come back the same day because as the business grows, obviously you get busier doing other things, management and going to wool sales. So I've found that flying an aeroplane for me is about the only way I can successfully run my business. Uh, and um, as I said, our, our business is a little bit unique because we... We have so much of our business in the outback compared to some of the other brokers who are, their clients might be all sort of within 100 kilometres of their town. Well, with us, we have, we have clients who are 700 kilometres from Dubbo. And that's, you know, we, I just don't have the time to spend in the car to drive out there. Uh, and I still believe that personal service and face-to-face -face contact Uh, with 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 our clients is is the best way to fully understand what their requirements are and, and whilst um, you know this technology we're using now uh, talking to Germany uh, in real time is is great um, with with the growers and farmers probably being um, a little bit more conservative and a bit slower to uptake new technology they still like to see you at sharing time and, and talk to you face to face so that's how it works for me yes and um also when i think i once had the chance of flying with you uh, when we went to louth uh, in your plane and i think it was then the farmer's uh, wife who was giving you instructions for landing on their property, right? So everything is kind of self-sufficiently organized. Is that how it is with the yes. air patrol? <laughs> yeah, no, um, it's, it's not um, looked at as unusual. In fact, when I started flying, clients said, well, it's great. We, we know we can get to see you more often. And, and they all have uh, radios based in their houses. And so I can call up 
call up as I'm approaching and, and tell them I'm 10 minutes away and they'll send someone down to the airstrip to pick you up and it all works well. Yeah, and the other thing I wanted to say is that um, I guess for people who don't, you know, live in in not in rural areas but in in highly developed areas like here in Germany, we have very you know high speed roads and you know doing a thousand kilometers is possible in a, quite a quick time. But then roads in the outback are often just dirt roads, so you actually can't always drive that fast and you have to watch out not to hit a kangaroo so that also makes it more cumbersome to to go long distance in a faster speed yes and it's 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 also the wear and tear on the vehicles because of the dirt roads as you mentioned and you certainly did experience that when you came back from Louth. um you, you can wear a vehicle out for 12 months um so uh, it is an issue it's, uh, Mostly nowadays, people drive big four-wheel drives with big bars on the front, uh, and those vehicles are sort of built to withstand a lot more than they used to be. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then another thing I remember from my trip to Laos is that you told me that sometimes the outback that does get floods, and, and you mentioned that earlier today as well, and you told me the story of how the wool growers prepare because they can anticipate when the flood will be coming, so it's not um, like a big surprise overnight. And can you maybe explain to our listeners today how do the wool growers prepare for the floods and ensure that their livestock um, is well looked after? Yes, it's... Um There's, there are two types of floods. There's flooding from local rain, and that's a hard one to prepare for because there have been instances where, um, because the country's so flat, sometimes when you get a um, large quantity of, of rain in a short space of time, the water has nowhere to go because the country's flat. And if you have sheep in... Um, flood prone country that had a lot of wool on them, that be can become a major problem because once the sheep get wet, um, as we know, uh, one of wool's great properties is to the ability to absorb moisture uh, and it can work against the animal when the animal has um, seven kilos of wool on it and it gets wet, that seven kilos can turn into 20 kilos Uh, and then they can't walk. So the, the two types of flood is one from local rain, from big rain events. The other flood is where people who live on the channel systems and the rivers, and, and um, in New South Wales, the major rivers start on the east, eastern side or up in Queensland and flow down through the western outback of New South Wales towards South Australia. Now, when there's a lot of rain up in Queensland and on the east coast and those rivers that run west from the coast or from the mountain range near the coast, the growers normally have plenty of time to know and, and the radio every day gives river heights at certain points. So the farmers get to know when they listen to those river heights that the river heights upstream from them are at a certain level And then from data gathered over the years, they get a pretty good picture of what the river heights will get to in their area. So they can have as much as two months lead time to make sure that they've got their stock away from the flood prone areas. Um, so a long flood, and I've seen floods where the water will hang around for a couple of months, uh, that becomes an issue because half your country could be covered in water. And certainly there's properties along the Darling River that might be 100,000 acres or 40,000 hectares and 20,000 hectares of it is underwater. Not very deep, certainly not fast moving, but the sheep can't graze there. So they've got to, they've got to prepare and move the stock away from these places. They've got to make sure they don't get trapped on islands and um, sometimes choppers get called in to um, pick up uh, people go out in little boats and get onto these little islands and the choppers fly out with nets on them 
and the sheep are loaded into the nets and carried back to the higher ground. So generally, the floods that come from upstream can be managed with, with planning. The floods that happen locally, and you know, we saw a situation here in 2012 in the Brewarana district, which is northwest of uh, Dubbo, about 500 kilometres, where there were 17 inches of rain. Uh, let me put that in millimetres. Um, somewhere around 500 millimetres of rain in one night. And a lot of people got caught with that. And anyone who had sheep that had a lot of wool on them had real big issues. And that, that's much harder to plan for. Luckily, they're sort of events that might only come along every 20 or 30 years. Okay. Uh, but then earlier when we were preparing for our interview, you also said that last year you had great rains and, and that was really good for the region. And now this uh, year you're, you're actually quite dry. So that's also difficult to manage. The Like every year is really, really different then. Yes, it is. Um, the situation last year was that we had um, phenomenally wet autumn winter and early spring uh, from sort of April through till uh, October, we had r rivers that had six and seven floods during that period. And um, it, it was fantastic for uh, the fodder. There was lots of hay made, the crops were good and, um, you know, everyone was happy. In, in fact, it, it was almost too wet um, for the sheep. This year, we've had the complete opposite. Uh, in the outback, there's been very few isolated storms through the summer, and there hasn't been one decent winter rain pattern come through. And they normally start coming through in May, and here we are, middle of July, and we haven't had one come through yet. So a lot of people starting to get worried. Um, grain prices uh, are starting to rise quite significantly and hay reserves are being chewed into. So we will get to a point in another month where it'll be too late for the crops. If it doesn't rain soon, a lot of the crops will fail. And um, that then poses all sorts of problems for next year because there's no grain on hand to feed stock. So it is, it is quite concerning. And um, you know, a lot of farmers are now making plans about how they're going to deal with ewes that are lambing because we're coming up to the peak lambing period which is August, September um, and so farmers are now starting to make plans on how they're going to manage the most critical time of the year for the ewe is prior, just prior to and for the six weeks after lambing is rearing that lamb. Um, so it is, um, it is getting a little bit serious and a little bit concerning. And you said to me earlier as well that you find that the wool growers have become better and better at, in, in dealing with these kind of climate change related issues. Can you talk a little bit more on that? Yes. Um, a couple of things with that. Firstly, um, the, far the farmers, uh, whilst conservative by nature, are always looking at ways to manage the environment better. And um, as, as we, we know, the Australian environment is fairly fragile, always has been. Um, the climate has been changing. We only have 150 or 160 years of climate recordings here. So when, when we get a drought, that might go for five years and, and people say, oh, it's climate change. Well, yes, the climate does change, but we don't know that these didn't happen, you know, thousands of years ago because the the records that we have are such a short space in time to try and formulate averages on. So as the years go on and technology improves, certainly weather forecasting has improved uh, a lot and farmers are now, uh, preparing themselves better for what some of these forecasts um, are delivering. And there's you know, methods of um, stock handling, feeding sheep, uh, 
uh, auto self feeders, uh, grain transferring, um, all those things are now at the farmer's fingertips. And even in the outback, we're starting to see some of the bigger farmers out there gear themselves up with grain facilities, with silos and augers and, and feeder bins and self feeders so that they can manage it better. Because the other factor is there's good return in the merino sheep at the moment. The wool prices are quite good. Farmers are happy with the prices and they're certainly happy with the price of their lambs and their cast parade sheep, surplus sheep, etc. So the returns in the merino industry at the moment are enabling farmers to utilise some of that more modern technology. And so it's, uh, whilst it becomes very expensive when you start trucking grain in by semi-trailer loads to feed sheep, at the moment, it pays. It's it's better than actually selling them, and, and every because sheep numbers are very low, and you're probably well aware of how historically low wool production is, and and sheep production and merino ewes um, form a smaller proportion of the breeding flock than what they used to, and so um, it's it's not something that a farmer wants to do is just sell his sheep and then later on hope he can buy back. It's not that easy to do. So what we're seeing now when we get into tough times, they're actually looking at ways of how they can look after their sheep, get more production out of them, hang on to them, feed them, look after them. Uh, it, it'll be costly, but they know the returns are going to be there when the drought breaks. Okay, that, that was quite interesting to hear. Okay, and now, okay, we talked a lot about the Outback, but I also want to talk a little bit again about you. And what I found interesting was the story that you actually grew up on a dairy farm, but then once you kind of touched wood, you were changed for good. So tell me, what is it exactly that fascinates you so much about wool and the wool industry? Look, I think when... Um My, my mother's family um, had a background in the wool industry and the sheep industry. And when I was a kid growing up over near the coast on our dairy farm, school holidays, we would go and visit the uncle out in the country. And I remember going as a, as a boy of six or seven, going to the shearing shed and playing in the wool bins. And I just thought it was like, I just liked the smell the animals, the people, uh, and and then when I left school and did a diploma in agriculture and it included wool classing, it sort of brought back to me, that's right, I really remember this. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of history and folklore around the shearing industry, the wool industry. Um, you know, we were told when we were going to school in the 60s and 70s that Australia rode on the sheep's back. And so I just thought it was something I wanted to be part of. And um, there, there was um, you know, the famous um, the famous paintings you see of um, Tom Roberts and the ram shearing and the famous poems by Banjo Patterson and people like that, a lot of them uh, around... Um, The sheep and wool industry. So when I went to work in the in the sheds, in the shearing sheds in the outback, I just that that was it for me. I didn't want to do anything else. So um, <laughs> I still love it today. Yeah, and yeah, I I can imagine, and I think it's always wonderful to hear how passionate people working in the wool industry are, and that it yeah sustains them the whole life. And well, can was, you? Sorry, yes? The other thing I, I meant to say, uh, Elizabeth, is. Once, once you sort of get a greater understanding of, of the animal, the sheep and, and the fibre, you get hooked. And um, I, I just love the fact that we work with a natural fibre that's renewable, that's biodegradable, that we work with a sheep that um, uh, not only gives you fibre, it gives you meat. So uh, in, in agriculture, and, and a lot of people like working in agriculture because they can see that what they do um, feeds the world and clothes the world. And, and I enjoy that aspect of it as well. Yeah, that, that's true. Um, yeah. And also tell me what 
is your favorite moment or experience that you had in during your career in the wool industry? Well, um, there are many, and, and often it's around the wool sale and um, having clients that uh, come to wool sales and, and get great prices. Certainly when, when the business first started, the market uh, was very high in, in April 1988. Uh, the market reached uh, a record level. Um, but later in the years, um, when we built the new wool store here in Dubbo, which was uh, finished in late 2011, um, the, the, the wool market was, was, that was the year the wool market really broke its shackles. I, I believe uh, even though the stockpile ran out in 2001, it took another 10 years after that for the free market to really readjust itself after all those years of floor prices and stockpiles and so much pain that, that wool growers and everyone else in the pipeline went through um, post the collapse of the floor price and four and a half million bales in the stockpile. And in 2011, we started to really see that there was going to be a good future in the industry. And we built the new wool store here in Dubbo and Early the following year in 2012, we had a grand opening for the clients as a, as a thank you for them for sticking with us. And we had uh, 420, 30 people came and sat down to a black tie dinner. And with the help of AWI, we put on a fashion parade in the wool store that um, was, I think, the most memorable moment for me in the wool industry was to. Um, was the culmination of almost uh, 30 years of work. The wool industry's been to hell and back. And um, that night, uh, with some professional models, plus some year 12 school students, one of which was my daughter, um, in front of 400 of our great clients, uh, for me, that was, that was the best moment in the wool industry. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a really memorable evening and event for your business and for you personally. Thank you for sharing that. Now, before we come to an end, how can our listeners find out more about you and your company? What's the best way to connect with you? Well, we have a Facebook page, McDonald and Company Wool Brokers, Facebook or Mac Wool. Um, and we put, um, we put weekly market reports on there. We put... Um, Photographs from clients of wool sales and field days and cheering sheds and just little stuff that's interesting that's going on in our part of the world. We have our website, which is uh, MacWool, M A C W O O L dot com dot AU. And on that, every week, every Friday afternoon, we post the weekly wool market report. Uh, and as we speak, that wool market report will be posted in the next sort of being typed up and it'll be posted very soon. People can go on the website and and read what we believe and certainly had a lot of feedback. It's one of the best comprehensive market reports in the industry because we put a lot of personal commentary into it about what's happening, why the market did what it did, plus anything else that's of interest in the industry. So our website and Facebook probably... Uh, The, the two best ways, and I, I googled Mac Wool only a couple of hours ago, and the website came up first, and the Facebook page came up second. So that's an easy way to find it. Well, well, that's a good uh, ranking for your company on Google. Well done on that. Thank you for sharing that. I make sure to link to the Facebook page and the web page also in the show notes so that it's easy for everyone to find it. Well done. I really appreciate your time and all the stories and details you told us about your company, but also especially about the Outback and also the great work that the wool growers and your clients are doing in the wool industry. So thank you so much for sharing that. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. It's been special talking to you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Now, did you get a new perspective on the Australian outback from Don McDonald? It is a really special place to live and grow wool. And I hope that came across in the interview today. 
If you want to find out more about Don and his business, McDonald and Co. Wool Brokers, then visit the show notes at elizabethvandelden.com forward slash 042. Once again, that is elizabethvandelden.com forward slash 042. We love that you're listening to this podcast and really appreciate you. Make sure you also connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. See you there and bye for now.